On December 25, 2019, Dr. Liu Xiaohong noticed a number of infections at his Wuhan hospital that weren't responding to treatment. It wasn't clear what was wrong with them, but tests quickly showed a coronavirus similar to SARS. Five days later, the director of the emergency department at Wuhan Central Hospital, Ai Fen, noted the words SARS coronavirus on a patient's report being referred to an ophthalmologist. At the same time, she alerted other doctors through the online forum WeChat. When the ophthalmologist Li Wenliang saw it that day, he also posted a message, this time on the social media site Weibo. Li became famous for being questioned by the Public Security Bureau a few days later and forced to sign a confession admitting to disturbing the social order. But he wasn't the only one. Ai Fun and at least seven other whistleblowers were also officially admonished. On December 31st, five days after the virus had first been detected, China alerted the World Health Organization. But the Chinese authorities played down the threat, and their report was overly optimistic. They assured the WHO that the virus could be contained. So the public was kept in the dark. Even when the Wuhan seafood market was closed down the next day, the Chinese authorities again played down the threat, claiming the closure was just for renovation. In a land where the press is muzzled, there was no one to question them or investigate. It wasn't until January the 9th that the Chinese government finally admitted to the severity of the outbreak and shared the sequencing of the genetic code. The story became worldwide news. That same day, the WHO alerted governments around the world and told them this was a deadly new strain of coronavirus. The reaction of those governments was mixed, a balancing act between protecting civil liberties, economic health and public health. Those are cultural and political issues that I don't cover on this channel. What does concern me is when governments don't understand or disregard scientific advice and even misrepresent scientific facts in order for good public relations. Because, as the Chinese experience has shown, that has consequences. In Brazil, President Bolsonaro brushed the new virus off, likening it to the flu. And even several weeks after health experts in the United States were warning about the severity and fatality of the new virus, President Trump did the same. We view this the same as the flu. When somebody sneezes, I mean, I try and bail out as much as possible with the sneezing. I mean, we've never closed the country before, and we've had some pretty bad flus, and we've had some pretty bad viruses. And I... In fact, the new virus, officially called SARS-CoV-2, is very different to the flu. Firstly, it's far more contagious, which means you have to take much stronger measures than you would to protect yourself against flu. Secondly, the flu has been around for a long time, so people have built up a large degree of immunity to it. When the new virus broke out, no one had immunity to it, because by definition it is new. Thirdly, we have vaccines against the flu, which greatly reduces the number of people infected and the seriousness of the infection. There's no vaccine yet for the new coronavirus. And fourthly, the mortality rate is much higher. What kills you is not the virus itself, but the disease that comes from the virus. So while the official name of the new coronavirus is SARS-CoV-2, the disease it causes is called COVID-19. President Trump made the argument that far more people are killed every year by the flu than have been killed by COVID-19. So does that mean the flu is more deadly than COVID-19? No, of course not. Comparing the number of deaths from COVID-19 at the start of an epidemic after just one month with the total annual number of deaths from flu, is not comparing like with like. That means it's not science and it's misleading. And the flu is higher than that. The flu is much higher than that. No, it isn't. The reporter, who happens to be a doctor and a medical correspondent, got the figure right. Influenza has a death rate of about 0.1%. And COVID-19? For today, the global death rate at 3.4 percent and a report that the Olympics could be delayed. Your reaction to that? Well, I think the 3.4 percent is really a false number. Now, this is just my hunch. No, the figure is correct because it's simple maths. The number of deaths at the time of the study divided by the total number of reported cases. That's the number of people who've tested positive. 
It's known as the case fatality rate, or more colloquially, the death rate. This was explained when the figure was given. Globally, about 3.4% of reported COVID-19 cases have died. So it depends on the number of people being tested. A lot of people aren't tested because they're asymptomatic. In other words, they develop very mild or no symptoms and may not even bother contacting a doctor. If everyone who actually contracted COVID-19 was tested and counted, the case fatality rate would be lower. Researchers estimate that's around 1%. The death rate also depends on demographics because it's dramatically higher in older people and those with underlying health conditions. So the figure will vary from population to population. The president shouldn't be relying on hunches to guess at these crucial figures. He should be listening to experts who can explain what they are and what they mean. Like epidemiologist Dr Anthony Fauci, who had no trouble explaining it to members of Congress. Um, If you look at the cases that have come to the attention of the medical authorities in China, and you just do the math, the math is about 2%. If you look at certain age groups, certain risk groups, the fatality is much higher. Mm -hmm. But as a group, it's going to depend completely on what the factor of asymptomatic cases are. So if you have asymptomatic cases that are a lot, it's going to come down. What we're hearing right now on a recent call from the WHO this morning is that there aren't as many asymptomatic cases as we think, which may them elevate, I think, what their mortality is. You, should, you know, as well as anybody, that the mortality for seasonal flu is 0.1%. So even if it goes down to 1%, it's still 10 times more fatal. So if the president isn't taking the advice and accepting the figures of his own experts, where is he getting his flu comparisons and erroneous figures from? Well, I'm no expert on his movements, but I do know he spends a lot of time watching Fox News, where he would have heard this. Some years, tens of thousands of people die from the flu. Every year, people die from the flu. It's a virus like the flu. It actually can be mistaken for the flu. The president also came up with another suggestion. You know, a lot of people think that goes away in April with the heat, as the heat comes in. We're in great shape, though. You know, in April, supposedly, it dies with the hotter weather. Looks like by April, you know, in theory, when it gets a little warmer, it miraculously goes away. I hope that's true. What theory is that? Trump certainly didn't get that from his scientific advisors or from any experts because there's no evidence for it at all. Now, COVID-19 may start to subside in the spring and summer, but that'll be because all viruses follow a bell curve. But as thousands of cases in Southeast Asia and other tropical areas show, hot weather is no impediment to this virus. So where does the myth come from? Of course, it's our old friend, the Internet. This list, for example, has been passed around Facebook and Twitter from someone who claims to have heard from someone whose uncle is a doctor in Shenzhen. The poster said the man said his uncle said that the virus is killed by temperatures above 26 or 27 degrees. If you're stupid enough to believe Unsaw's crap on Twitter, I guess you're not smart enough to wonder why the virus would then be able to thrive in normal body temperatures of 37 degrees. The BBC tracked down the person they say started the list, an 84-year-old man called Peter. Everything I posted, I believe genuinely to be the truth and factual. Oh, as long as you genuinely believed it, that's fine then. Look, here's a better idea, Pete. Stop spreading this junk science in the first place. Because this is the kind of stuff President Trump sees, and before you know it, it overrides the advice of his own scientific experts. The frustrating thing is that the president doesn't need to get his information from the internet or Fox News. He has an infectious diseases expert standing right next to him at nearly every news conference. One of many. But for reasons I'll let you figure out, they can't tell the president directly. They have to correct him in more subtle ways, like explaining the facts to someone else while the president is listening. But I don't have to tread on eggshells. Thanks to freedom of speech, I can say no, especially to a president who's publicly giving out misleading and overly optimistic information in the middle of a health crisis. A drug called chloroquine. And some people would add to it hydroxy, 
hydroxychloroquine. No, they call hydroxychloroquine hydroxychloroquine because it's a different chemical and a different drug. It's a less toxic derivative of chloroquine and is used to treat different ailments. But the nice part is it's been around for a long time. So we know that if it if if things don't go as uh, planned, it's not going to kill anybody. No, we don't know that at all. That's why medical researchers have to do clinical trials. Both of these drugs have side effects, sometimes dangerous side effects for people with certain medical conditions. And although anecdotal evidence suggests that they don't have any adverse effects in COVID-19 patients, a proper trial is needed to ensure that if you give the drug to thousands of people struggling to breathe, it won't end up killing them. And it's shown very encouraging, very, very encouraging early results. But this is just anecdotal evidence. Doctors need to know what the side effects are, how much will be effective, and over what period of time. And we're going to be able to make that drug available almost immediately. No, you won't. At the time of the press conference, it's only available to urgent cases and people involved in clinical trials. Most patients with COVID-19 won't have access to it until the clinical trials are over and it's been approved to treat COVID-19. And that's where the FDA has been so great. They, uh, they've gone through the approval process. It's been approved. No, they haven't. Chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine have only been approved for their specified uses. They haven't yet been approved for the treatment of COVID-19. And they did it. They took it down from many, many months to uh, immediate. So we're going to be able to make that drug available by prescription. Again, only for urgent cases and people involved in the clinical trials. It's fine to give people hope and to be optimistic, but not to mislead them. These drugs may indeed prove to be effective, but we have to wait and see. In the meantime, saying a cure is already here can lead to complacency and even dangerous self-medication. The experts can't contradict the president as bluntly as I have, so another trick they use is to change what the president said to something that is correct and then pretend the president had said it. Many Americans have read studies and heard media reports about this drug chloroquine, which is an anti-malarial drug. It's already approved, as the president said, for the treatment of malaria as well as an arthritis condition. Evidence. So as the commissioner of FDA and the president mentioned yesterday, we're trying to strike a, a balance between making something with a potential of an, a, of an effect uh, to the American people available at the same time that we do it under the auspices of a protocol that would give us information to determine if it's truly safe and truly effective. We prove for what the president was saying is that we're going to look at all of these drugs and we're going to try to get them available in the context of some sort of a protocol where you just don't distribute drugs willy-nilly. You may make it more accessible than you would have previously, but you do it in the context yeah. to at least get some feel for both safety and whether it works. That was the message about the malaria drug, hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine. In a candid interview with the journal Science, Fauci admitted that he had to walk a fine line. The question was put to him. Trump keeps saying that the travel ban for China, which began 2nd of February, had a big impact on slowing the spread of the virus to the United States and that he wishes China would have told us three to four months earlier and that they were very secretive. It just doesn't comport with facts. Fauci said, I know, but what do you want me to do? I mean, seriously, John, let's get real. What do you want me to do? And then the question, you're standing there as the representative of truth and facts, and things are being said that aren't true and aren't factual. Fauci said, the way it happened is that after he made that statement, suggesting China could have revealed the discovery of a new coronavirus three to four months earlier, I told the appropriate people, it doesn't comport because two to three months earlier would have been September. The next time they sit down with him and talk about what he's going to say, they'll say, by the way, Mr. President, be careful about this and don't say that. But I can't jump in front of a microphone and push him down. OK, he said it. Let's try and get it corrected for the next time. The three months referred to this comment. Our relationship with China is a very good relationship. I wish they told us three months sooner that this was a problem. We didn't know about it. 
They knew about it, and they should have told us. We could have saved a lot of lives throughout the world. But the United States did know about it as early as January the 9th. The WHO put out a worldwide alert. It was even reported in the American media. Six days later, a passenger flight from Wuhan brought the virus to the United States and was diagnosed on January the 20th. By January 22nd, the virus had spread to 10 other countries and thousands of people were infected. And this was the president's reaction that day in Davos. Have you been briefed by the CDC? I have. Are the words about a pandemic at this point? No, we're not at all, and uh, we're, we have it totally under control. It's one person coming in from China, and we have it under control. It's uh, going to be just fine. And it wasn't until a week later, and three weeks after the U.S. had been notified about the severity of the virus, that the Trump administration set up a task force to monitor it. Two days later, it finally ordered the quarantining of visitors from the infected countries. By then, it was too late. The virus was already present inside the USA and spreading. And not enough testing was being done to contain it. A month later, more than seven weeks after the US government had been alerted to the severity of the new virus, hospitals and labs were finally allowed to conduct their own COVID-19 tests. In the meantime, attempts to minimise the outbreak continued, completely contrary to the science and to the medical advice being given. We have it totally under control. It's one person. We think we have it very well under control. We pretty much shut it down, coming in from China. And I think the numbers are going to get progressively better as we go along. We have it very much under control in this country. People are getting better. They're all getting better. The uh, coronavirus, which is... um, you know, very well under control in our country. And the 15 within a couple of days is going to be down to close to zero. Because of all we've done, the risk to the American people remains very low. The coronavirus, you know that, right? Coronavirus. And this is their new hoax. We're talking about very small numbers in the United States. Our numbers are lower than just about anybody. Saying we have it under control and have stopped it several weeks after the first case was detected, and while infection rates were rapidly rising, is exactly what China was criticised for during the two weeks of its rosy denials. But when image and public relations confront reality, it's reality that will eventually win. I've always known this is a, this is a real, this is a pandemic. But there are worrying signs that the president still only wants to hear good news and even criticise the media for reporting bad news. One of his first actions after appointing Mike Pence's response team at the end of February was to muzzle health officials. Dr Fauci was told he had to get clearance through the vice president's office before talking to the media. I don't really care if I get in trouble for speaking to the media. I want people to know that this is bad. People are dying. We don't have the tools that we need in the emergency department and in the hospital to take care of them. And and it's really hard. The frustrating thing about all of this is it really just feels like it's too little too late. Like we knew. We knew it was coming. What do you say to Americans who are watching you right now who are scared? Uh, I say that you're a terrible reporter. That's what I say. I think it's a very nasty question, and I think it's a very bad signal that you're putting out to the American people. The American people are looking for answers, and they're looking for hope. That's really bad reporting. No, the answer to that very sensible question should be, I want to reassure Americans who are scared that we'll get through this. You don't need to be scared, but you do need to be cautious. Follow the medical advice... If we do those things together as a nation, we'll get through this more safely and more quickly. In other words, you give people hope by being honest with them, not painting a false picture of the science and then blaming the press for not doing the same. Because science is about reality, it deals with the way things really are, not the way we wish they were or hope they'll be or think they ought to be. Reality doesn't change depending on your nationality or your religious, political or ideological position. When people are forced to choose between believing a politician they like and a scientist they don't know, they'll often go with the politician and reject the science. That's why only 40% of Republicans who trusted the president thought the worst was yet to come, as opposed to 80% of Democrats. And here's the problem with that. 
When people believe their presidents claim that the virus is no worse than the flu and it's already been stopped, and they see him shaking hands and holding rallies, they become complacent. They lose any concern about catching it or passing it on. If I get corona, I get corona. At the end of the day, I'm not going to let it stop me from partying. Fortunately, Fox News has recently changed its tone. It's a virus, like the flu. It actually can be mistaken for the flu. We are facing an incredibly contagious and dangerous virus. There's tens of thousands of people die from the flu. Every year people die from the flu. We're fighting an invisible enemy, and now slowing the spread is crucial. It is key. No, the time to slow the spread of the virus was crucial and key as soon as the first case was detected in the United States. Comparisons are often made with South Korea because South Korea and the United States both had their first case of the virus on the same day, January 20th. The South Korean government didn't pretend it had contained the virus, didn't question the medical advice, and assumed that the number of infections wouldn't rise. It took action. Within two weeks, it had begun mass testing. It followed WHO guidelines, tested people who were at risk, got test results quickly, quarantined them if they tested positive, tested people who came into contact with those who'd tested positive, and then quarantined them if they tested positive. In just seven weeks, the South Korean health authorities had tested 290,000 people without the need for a national lockdown. In the United States, during the same period, only 60,000 tests had been performed, even though the population is six times larger, and it took much longer to get test results. The okay. idea of anybody getting it easily, the way people in other countries are doing it, we're not set up for that. Do I think we should be? Yes, but we're not. Nobody knew there'd be a pandemic or an epidemic of this proportion. Nobody's ever seen anything like this before. But of course, that's... Not correct. Less than a year into his presidency, Foreign Affairs magazine warned that a pandemic could strike and that the Trump administration may be woefully unprepared. Three years into his presidency, Trump should have read, or at least been briefed, about an intelligence report assessing worldwide threats, including the fact that the world was vulnerable to the next flu pandemic or large-scale outbreak of contagious disease that could lead to massive rates of death and disability. The previous administration set up a pandemic response team to prepare for just such an emergency, but in 2018 the Trump administration disbanded it. The head of the response team, Timothy Zima, had to resign, and members of the team were absorbed into other units within the National Security Council. Many experts warned that the move would leave the United States dangerously exposed to any pandemic. This isn't 2020 hindsight. It was written two years before the current pandemic. The White House proposal is threatening to claw back funding whose precise purpose is to help the United States be able to respond quickly in the event of a crisis, said Carolyn Reynolds, a vice president at PATH, a global health technology non-profit. It seems to actively unlearn the lessons we learned through very hard experience over the last 15 years, said a senior policy fellow at the Center for Global Development. These moves make us materially less safe. It's inexplicable. So why did the Trump administration do it? Well, you'd have to ask the president. Um, my first question is, you said that you don't take responsibility, but you did disband the White House pandemic office, and the officials that were working in that office left this administration abruptly. So what responsibility do you take to that? And the officials that worked in that office said that, you, that the White House lost valuable time because that office wasn't disbanded. What do you make of that? Well, I just think it's a nasty question, because what we've done is, uh, and Tony had said numerous times that uh, we've saved thousands of lives because of the quick closing. Uh, and when you say me, I didn't do it. Uh, we have a group of people. I could I could ask perhaps my administration, but I could perhaps ask uh, Tony about that because uh, I don't know anything about it. As I said at the beginning, not every country has managed this crisis well. That's politics. And every country has had its share of MUC experts, including my own. In spite of all the money spent on education, we revert to hysteria and alarmism. We now seem to be facing the health version of global warming. Exaggeration in almost everything. The thing is, most governments ignore these amateurs and prefer to go with professional scientific advice when it comes to issues of science. 
there'll inevitably be snafus and incompetence in response to any crisis. But what concerns me is that this is always compounded when leaders of countries don't accept scientific advice, downplay scientific reality, and act on hunches and misinformed beliefs rather than science. That clearly has affected how the crisis is managed. A study from Oxford University found that while governments had varying delays in taking action, the US government delayed the longest. It waited until there were over 1,000 infections inside its borders before taking stringent measures against it. Only Britain came a close second. So this isn't a question of whether you support President Trump or you don't, whether you like him or loathe him. This is about scientific advice, taking precedence over political expediency. I hope that's something we should all be concerned about.